All right, sounds good. Apparently when you put your video up at the top, it prevents the thingy from coming down. So that's a, another good tip to learn. Yeah, there's a lot of little settings things that have changed in this as Zoom continues to kind of deal with security and they push updates now without warning. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're going, it's, it's different. It's not doing it the same way. All right, well, thank you very much, Randy, for uh, the opportunity here. Um, it, while Randy was thanking everyone else, I want to thank a hat tip to the, uh, the, the planning committee, Randy in particular, um, when they decided to expand the, um, the online conference, Randy approached me and said, would you like to talk? And I said, sure. And he wrote a title for me and he wrote a description for me. And then he sat down with me last night and said, okay, now here's some of the things I'd like you to do. Um, so it was wonderful in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of uh, preparation that uh, they did for us here. And a, a really a, a big thank you to the, the folks that were involved in that because it has been something that uh, it, you never quite know what an audience, what the planners were thinking when they asked you to speak. So you're always never quite sure if you give them what they were hoping you give them, um, unless they come right out and tell you. And, um, you know, so it's always appreciated for speakers when they can do that. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mike Barber. Um, I've been in the K-12 distance learning world now for I guess it's been just a little bit over two decades. I started with a, uh, a district-based program that I actually set up back in Bonavista, Newfoundland, and uh, known as the Center for Advanced Placement Education. And then even though I was still teaching in Bonavista, um, I ended up working with the Illinois Virtual High School through a, sort of a, what would be seen now as a bit of comedy of errors. Um, while this program was going on, the province decided to set up a province-wide virtual school that's still in existence, the Center for Distance Learning Innovation, which I got involved with. And uh, during that period, we even set up a private online high school that we used to um, essentially sell courses or have students from the U.S. enroll. And it was a way for our school districts to uh, make a little bit of money off of that through St. Brendan's College. Um, I can't remember what the Latin is there but you know it's 20 years ago so you'll forgive me for that um, as a faculty member researcher evaluator um, course designer etc um, i've been involved with getting the research group set up with what was the international association for k-12 online learning uh, it's now the aurora institute in the u.s INACL, which randy had mentioned a bit ago um, we've set up, it's actually about 11 years ago now, 12 years ago, there is a K-12 online learning SIG in the Society for Information Technology and Teacher Ed. So if you ever want to crash course in terms of what's going on in the research uh, when it comes to the field, site is a good conference to attend. And they have a pretty reasonable K-12 teacher rate as well, and usually good locations. It was New Orleans this year. I believe it's San Diego next year, although I'm not 100% sure. And then as Randy mentioned, I was part of the, the group and I see several folks in the, the list of people here that were involved with the um, founding of, of Can E Learn some years ago. And, uh, but beyond all of that, my main role is as a researcher in the field. And I've been fortunate enough that I've worked with a lot of uh, good colleagues so that I've been able to be one of the more prolific folks in the field. Oh, thank you, Brad. Brad just translated the Latin there for us in that old uh, slogan that we had with St. Brendan. So that was a, uh, I, I honestly say I, I, I didn't come up with that. I couldn't have come up with that because I'd never be that crafty. Um, but beyond all of sort of my background in the field, I think probably the one thing I'm, I'm known for the most is my disposition when I look at how the field is. Um, and I had to take a picture of this when it happened. It was about a decade ago. I was living in Windsor, Ontario at the time. And you know how at the time, Max would just have random words from the dictionary scroll across the screen as part of the screensaver? Well, it seemed that one appeared on my screen an awful lot. Um, so I, I had to take a picture to make sure that folks knew about it. Although I always enjoy coming and speaking with a group from 
uh, BC. I noticed that one of the sponsors this year was the EDL PSA. And uh, the folks in BC, for whatever reason, seem to like me because back, I guess this was about 10 years ago now, Dave was running the, um, the uh, PSA at the time, I believe. And uh, I was listed as a benefit of membership, which I thought was always quite uh, uh, humorous. Um, but again, the one thing that I'm known for in the field is sort of that temperament and that uh, uh, I tend to challenge a lot of the things and, and oftentimes from a um, sarcastic or ironic manner. And I think that's one of the things I want to do today because a lot of what we've had over the last three and a half days are folks that have been talking about innovative things that they've been doing um even just useful tips that you've had along the way but we've really sort of been in a bit of a bubble here and um so it's it's my turn to play a little statler and waldorf here uh from the muppets and take a look at you know the community that we've had here over the past couple of days compared to what the rest of k-12 looks like so as an example, like when I look at one of my courses, and this is a course that I taught this semester in the, the Doctor of Nursing program. So it's a research course for the, the DNP students. You know, it's organized based upon sessions. Every single session is broken down into these three components. The introduction is basically just a brief little thing. And then there's a couple of objectives there that are written in student friendly language. You have to go into the content, which gives you the readings, and then there's a quiz that they have to do based on those readings to unlock the actual real content. And they've got to score eight out of 10 on the quiz. It's an ungraded quiz um, in terms of it doesn't count towards their final score. So it's a formative assessment as you're going through. But it's a way that I can make sure that they read those four chapters that I was looking for, and even in the way in which I've done those. You know, you've got the chapters are listed there, but then I provide a one sentence advanced organizer for the students. So I let them know essentially what I think are the main things I want them to get out of that chapter. You know, so they go in and take the quiz and it's a 10 question quiz, but I actually have 20 questions in the quiz bank. And I've set it up so that it'll randomly pull out 10 each time and it will mix up the responses each time. So they don't necessarily get the same quiz every time that they take it to make the, uh, you know, so they can't essentially just write down all of the questions and then go look them up after the first time because they might get a different set of questions. Once they actually get into the content, there's these brief little introductions and then these little eight to 12 minute videos because that's essentially the attention span that we can work with. At the bottom of that page, there's always a little bit of an assignment that they can do, and this is where the summative assessment comes in. And then I finish off each week with just a checklist, which the students actually tend to copy and paste these checklists, print them off and just stick them on the wall somewhere so that they can cross them out as they go through. And while everything has to be done by the end of the week, you'll see in blue there, I sort of give them goals to set for so that they can sort of work their way through. You know, and as I was thinking about the experience we've had over the past couple of days and some of the discussions, one of the things that I, I thought about was, you know, this is not necessarily, you know, how it's always been when it comes to the way that I teach online. You know, now I'll admit I'm a bit of a, a, a fortunate case in terms of coming to technology. When I was eight or nine, uh, I was living in Buckins, Newfoundland, a little community, mining community of at the time, about 1800. And if you gassed up at the Irving, you got a ticket in a jar. And who, at some point in time, they drew who won um, this Commodore 64. And it's not necessarily this one. This is just a stock picture I found online. But I was eight or nine when I basically got my first computer. It was a, a lovely Commodore 64 and actually had all of the peripheries that they have there. So it had the tape deck and it had the floppy drive that went along with it, which was a wonderful little thing at the time. I was probably in my early teens when I got my first 386 and um, the box that you see there that has the 40 on it, I probably took that thing apart within a year of getting it and um, it probably spent more time apart than it spent together. Um, I don't think I ever bothered to put the back part on ever again because I kept you know, swapping things out because eventually 
you could put another hard drive in one of those slots. You had the ability to put a CD-ROM in at one point. There were cards in the back where you could put your modem and uh, something for like a little keypad. Because at the time, the first keyboards didn't have a keypad. They had a, a separate one. And then I went off to Carleton University and I was a member of the Young Liberals there and this would have been the early 90s and the Young Tories on campus had a website. And being the competitive little SOB that I was at the time, um, I thought, well, there's no way I'm letting them do that and we're not going to have one. So I sat down with a, a guy who lived down the hall from me and he taught me how to code in HTML so that I could build websites. And by the time I was finished in Ottawa, um, I had actually spent a fair amount of time working down on Parliament Hill. And one of the things that I specialized in with several of the folks I worked with was essentially setting up some of their online presence. Well, I can't be the first to say that my member had the first website in Canada that was actually John Harvard, um, who was a Liberal MP from Ontario, if you're a uh, trivia person. But I had the first senator to have a website in Canada, and I had the second, third, fourth, and sixth MPs to have websites in Canada. Um, so, you know, when I went into teaching, I had a fairly good background in using technology for stuff. I had a fairly good background in creating websites and stuff like that. But this is actually two pages, so that little line in between shows you the division in the pages. This is two pages from the very first online course that I created back in my first year of teaching when I was at Discovery Collegiate in Bonavista after we created that Center for Advanced Placement Education. So this is the AP Human Geography course. And it's text, a few links, and I managed to stick one image on one of the two pages. And I think it's important as we start to look back at some of this that we remember where we started. And, you know, I'd like to pause here for a minute. Well, actually, probably two or three. And I I'm going to ask the group here, you know, we've got 70 or so folks in the room right now. When you first started teaching online and you had to design your own content, what did it look like? What kind of tools did you use back then? Not necessarily the specific tools, but you know, what were you using them for? And how well did you use them compared to how you're using them now? Seeing lots of things come through the chat. If anyone would like to grab the mic, they're free to do so for a minute. Feel free to chat. He's encouraging it. Oh, well, I use Moodle and um, I'm still using Moodle. I kind of wish um, that there was more bells and whistles and that there was some special app on my phone that I could just do everything and make super good videos. I still feel like I've got so much to learn. Michael, I, um, I, I started teaching um, sort of from a distance in sort of a blended model back before before there were Moodles, before anybody was really doing that with any kind of a, a learning management system. So I remember the days of every day updating my my personal website that I that I hosted that I hosted it on, you know, putting all the PDFs of the materials for my kids online. And, you know, I even had a little chat for after hours, office hours uh, that I would manage for them built in doing all the HTML stuff. I was first hired as a computer teacher. Um, and now looking at the, the change from, you know, to do that, and I'm sure you can appreciate, I think it's funny, I saw that picture of the computer case that you showed in your graphic. I think I had that exact same computer case 
um, on my first PC with the little red A that almost looks like a triangle on it. Like I swear that was my first computer case. Anyway, we'll have to compare notes. Yeah, totally. And it had the megahertz written um, on the front. I think mine was higher than yours, by the way. Anyway, um, just the, it was so much work to put all of that together for kids, but the uptake by kids, uh, you know, like it was, oh, well, I don't, if I miss a class, I can get all the notes off the website and, you know, all of the, he posts answer keys for, you know, all that sort of stuff that now is a bit taken for granted um, in the LMSs that we have that just continue to evolve and get better and better. Um, and I guess I'm, I am often surprised that there aren't more teachers taking advantage of the ability to so easily blend the learning for their kids with all of those tools available, right? Anyway, that's just my two bits. Actually, Paul, that the way in which you ended that actually, I think is a great segue into sort of where I'm going with this, because even as I looked through the list of things that were going down the, the side of the screen in terms of where people started and what they were doing. And, you know, even where I started, I mean, at least I was, you know, creating HTML pages, putting in hyperlinks, you know, I did see some folks talking about just posting PDFs and, and, and Word documents and that. Um, but for many of us, even when we first started in the DL environment, we were already kind of the techie folks. You know, we were the folks that had an interest in this. It's one of the reasons why we started when nobody else was doing this kind of thing. You know, you, the reality is the vast majority of folks that have been thrown into this emergency teaching environment, you know, they're not those techie folks. They were dragged into this kicking and screaming. And in many cases, you know, they, they really don't want to be here. They're looking forward to the day in which they never have to touch a single one of these tools ever again. And while I think we all realize because we are part of this bubble that can see some of the advantages and affordances that these tools can provide are wondering to ourselves, you know, well, once they start to use it and get some experience with it and play around with it a bit, you know, surely they'll see the potential of some of these tools and start to integrate it into their classroom. But, you know, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. And, you know, I mean, I'll give you a chance in a sec to, to chat again, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But, you know, the reality is, is that we have a group of teachers out there, and not just teachers, but teacher leaders, who believe that there are certain students that can't be taught online. And if you look at that, first paragraph there after the bullet point where it says Ontario teachers hosting virtual lessons. So the first bullet point or the first paragraph after that, you know, basically they're saying that because of their ability or because of some sort of, you know, the, the nature of a, a disability that they have with an IEP or maybe it's their age range or their um, ability to be an independent learner, you can list off whatever you'd like here that, you know, there are just some students that can't learn at a distance. And if you followed along sort of the media coverage that happened in Ontario over the last year, when they looked at this idea of, you know, mandatory e-learning there, it was a dominant theme, not just among teachers, not just among union leaders that wanted, you know, the, um, you know, that wanted to protect their own interests, um, not even just among the, um, the teachers that were sort of fearful of having to move into this environment or district folks that were concerned about privatization of public education and all these things. You know, one of the most common voices you heard in this was actually a researcher that was, you know, put up as one of the e-learning experts in the field um, for what it's worth, you know, and because there is a large segment within our population, at least I believe, that fully believes this particular statement that I've highlighted and read. That essentially the face-to-face -face classroom when it comes to education is the be all and end all and there is nothing that we can do regardless of the tools that we have at our disposal, regardless of how good we are at using those tools 
that could ever do the same kind of job that folks could do in the classroom. You know, and I mean, that is really what we're up against. So when we look at this idea that, you know, the there's a possibility that now that some of these teachers are experiencing these tools and using this content that, you know, it's just the tip of the sword. And, you know, now that they've had that experience, they're going to be much more interested in doing more of it. And I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. I mean, granted, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm in higher education. I'm, you know, right now in sunny California where it is some 27 degrees outside right now so you know maybe i really am living in la la land when it comes to this but i'll ask you you know based upon your colleagues particularly your colleagues that exist outside of our bubble of those that are just more techy in general based upon the students that you're now serving who've never taken an online course before and the parents that are at home trying to support them do you think that the experiences that they're having now are going to have a positive impact on their perceptions of whether or not online learning can be effective? I'm going to jump in. I I think with this, I'd say yes and no, because it depends on what their first experience was. I think that that very first experience influences what people think. So if the first step in was negative and nothing was working, that can really turn people off for a long time. But if they've been having success, then they're more likely to want to run with it and keep going. I work at a, a regular school one day a week and I found there's a real uh, gamut like some of the teachers are really enjoying being online and are planning to incorporate that going forward some of the other teachers were really struggling and found it way more work than they thought it would be and way more work than they regularly taught and so they're still finding their path through it so I don't know if it'll just it'll get better with time or they'll still feel that way people go into teaching for different reasons and have different strengths and uh, passion, so I think it, it will depend. I think a lot of things are, um, they take the path of least resistance. So if it's easiest for a, a teacher to go back to uh, a system that they were familiar with before they left uh, for this COVID um, situation, they'll likely go back to it. And for those people who are finding this easier and easier to access, they'll probably stick with it. That'd be my thought. I think that once um, students get over that initial hurdle of, of learning how to get on with the technology and working with it, they are going to find that it's a great benefit. You know, uh, working with some of my students right now, they're getting the best undivided attention where I can be sitting there and working with them and I don't have a whole classroom full of students running around beside me and they can get that attention that they need. So, you know, I, I think there'll be a good blend once teachers start learning more and more of this technology too. Thank you folks. And I've seen some robust discussion in the chat window as well around this. I saw a couple of times that folks mentioned the fact that, you know, while what we're doing now is using online tools and using online content, that it's not necessarily online learning. And while that's a point that I would take with the group that we have right here, it's a point that I would take if I was hearing it from someone sitting in the ministry or in my case, a department of education, you know, and as just this basic table shows here, I mean, there are some clear differences between, you know, online learning or distributed learning and remote learning. Um, in fact, oftentimes when you see it written, it's actually written as emergency remote learning or emergency remote teaching. You know, they add that emergency term in there. But I wonder how much that label and that terminology has permeated again beyond the bubble that we sit in. 
You know, so when I start looking at things that are coming through in the media, you know, I see them talking about online learning. I see them talking about e-learning. I see them talking about virtual schooling, but I don't see them talking about remote learning. The only time I ever see them talking about remote learning is when it comes directly from a government agency. You know, the media, when you look through the quotes in any of these articles, teachers in general, the parents that they're serving, they all use the term as if what you were doing last year is the exact same thing that the buffoon down the hall from you who's never turned on a computer in his life is doing right now. And they really don't see much of a difference from that. And it's not just, you know, the, the popular media or even the social media. You know, if you take a look at this just showed up in my inbox this morning. I actually, I'm glad I, Randy's not driving because if I had sent him my slides last night, this wouldn't have been in there. Um, you know, People for Education, which um, is normally a pretty reasonable organization, and I would recommend them for a lot of things. They're a nonprofit based in Ontario. In fact, that Canada-wide education and COVID tracker that I made sure I included in the item there is actually a wonderful tool. It goes through province by province and talks about what each province is doing to provide continuity of learning uh, through this experience. If there are links that the ministries or the departments have provided um, in terms of for announcements or for like a learning at home thing, those are all linked in there. It's a really wonderful, great resource. And I'll make sure that we get it up in the, the Google Doc. But if you look at the very next item, their annual technology and schools report. And specifically, if you look at the last sentence that they've got there, you know, this is what's considered a reasonable organization. And within the province of Ontario, they actually are not just considered reasonable, but considered an authority. You know, they, the Globe and Mail had a, a question and answer session with their executive director only a week and a half ago. You know, and one of the things that they're talking about in this report is, you know, what's happening right now in the world has given us an opportunity to examine more deeply how we are currently using technology in our schools along with the inequities and the potential in online learning so essentially the last six weeks in their mind is a good measure of looking at the potential of online learning in the province of ontario or for that matter any other province that you were looking at you know, so these are some of the things that, that we're dealing with right now. So when we are looking at whether or not, you know, the experience folks are having is going to influence how they view online learning and whether or not that's going to be uh, the tip of the sword in terms of a positive movement towards doing more blended stuff when we get back to some kind of face-to-face -face classroom teaching. I really don't think that the general public shares that perception and largely in part because I don't think the general public has been able to differentiate the difference between what you did a year ago and what the buffoon down the hall from you is doing right now. That difference between good distributed learning or good online learning and emergency remote teaching where you're just trying to keep your head above water. And I apologize if the guy down the hall from you and your actual school is, um, you know, quite tech savvy and as the guy you turn to for all of your advice on this. Um, it's just sort of a phraseology that I'm using, you know, but, and again, I ask this honestly, because even in the last question, you know, the last time I asked the question about how this might influence, you know, how people perceive this, listening to folks talk and specifically seeing what was going through the chat, we're not talking about the same people here. And maybe it's because the people that we attract are folks that have similar interests, similar skill sets, are doing similar things that we are doing. You know, there's a reason why Randy and I talk every single day, pretty much when it comes to, to these online learning things. And I'm not talking to you know, Annie, what's her name, who's the, the head of People for Education, you know, because of the fact that, you know, Randy and I share a similar worldview, although very different ways on how to go about getting there. 
um, we interact a great deal more. He's part of my bubble. You know, the folks at People from Educare, People for Education aren't part of my bubble. You know, so I'm wondering, and I won't pause this time just in the interest of time, because there's another question I want to get to a little bit more in a bit. But I'd ask you to think to yourself about, you know, the folks that, again, that, that curmudgeon down the hall who's turning on his computer for the first time during this particular pandemic, you know, how is he describing what he's doing right now and particularly the quality of it compared to what he does in the classroom? How are the students of all those non-DL teachers who don't have experience with these tools and don't have experience in using online curriculum describing the experience they're seeing their children having right now? You know, and I was glad we had Eleanor here yesterday because I think it was yesterday on Saturday because they're all Saturdays right now um, as we're moving through. So when Eleanor was here on Saturday, like Steve was here on Saturday and Trevor was here on Saturday and I'm here on Saturday. Um, one of the things she stressed was that even if we come back as normal in September, it's not going to be normal like it was six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. You know, what's going to be happening in September is going to look very different than what's happening now. And she, you know, and it's, I, I'd say I was very impressed with Eleanor's speech yesterday, Eleanor's talk yesterday, because um, it's the first time I've heard someone in the ministry say that, like, this is going to happen again next year, you know if you look at the history of pandemics and I work primarily at a medical school, so I've got all of these doctors sending things over the faculty listserv all the time. Um, we're going to get a second wave. And historically speaking, second waves tend to be much worse than first waves are uh, with the exception of recent history. You know, so if you go back past 20 years, second waves tend to be more deadly than first waves in many instances uh, because people are, have that fear factor in the first wave, whereas when the second wave comes and the vaccine might only be weeks or months away, there isn't that sort of fear motivating folks so they don't take the appropriate personal actions that we've seen happen right now. Um, you know, but even if there's not a general second wave, you know, there are going to be local clusters that are going to pop up from places. You know, there will be districts and all of the contiguous districts around that district or those districts that have to shut down for four, six, eight weeks next year. Um, you know, that's just the reality of the situation. And again, you know, looking at one side of the sword, again, this provides an opportunity because as a school leader, if I was a principal or working at the district right now, I'd be thinking about, okay, how can I start from the day that teachers are contractually obligated to be back on the job in the fall, getting them ready for that? How do I start incorporating those tools into our face-to-face -face teaching so that there isn't such a steep learning curve when we move to the blended environment? Um, but, you know, one of the things that, that's happening here is that because of the experience we're having now, people's opinion of what is going on has become quite jaded. And I'll put the link to this in the, um, in the document as well. Let's see if I can get it into the chat quickly. It's a wonderful little series that CBC, look at that, that CBC did that follows a family for eight days. Now, I'm not sure if it was eight continuous days or just eight random days, because but they did post it daily for eight days. Um, looking at the struggles that, you know, these three youngsters had when it came to online learning. And it paints a really interesting picture, one where either A, the parents are the primary teachers, or B, that online learning just isn't as good as the face-to-face -face alternative. You know, and then we've got this idea of, you know, the concerns that we have about privatization when it comes to education. And they're very real concerns because, you know, if you look at what is happening when it comes to online learning, regardless of jurisdiction, the more that we can take things out of the hands of teachers directly, be it the asynchronous content that gets put online, um, the more that we can autonomize things so that 
in theory, you can have a higher level of um, students for each teacher because the technology is doing so much of what it is a teacher used to do. You know, the other side of that sword is the fact that, you know, vendors are counting on this. You know, they're playing the long game here and that, you know, they're providing their tools, they're providing their content up available for free because once you see the need for it, then they're gonna have a customer for the next three, five, eight years as they're going through this. You know, and what's really happening above and beyond the privacy concerns that we heard about a couple of days ago, a couple of Saturdays ago, basically, um, you know, there are some real concerns in some jurisdictions, I'll be honest with you, more so in the US than in Canada, but even in some Canadian jurisdictions, I'm seeing it in Ontario, I'm seeing it in Alberta, not as much in British Columbia, um, although some talk about it in some circles, you know, about the fact that, you know, this deprofessionalization of the teaching field, the teaching profession of teachers in general. And on top of that, the, the privatization of public education. And it's something that we've seen in other jurisdictions because if you look at the US, I mean, in the United States, there are online charter schools and many of these online charter schools, and for that matter, brick and mortar charter schools are actually run either directly or indirectly by for-profit corporations. And while we say that's not something that we would envision happening in Canada, this idea that we would just abdicate our public responsibility for education and turn it over to Walmart or to McDonald's to run as they see fit, it's something that's happened a fair amount. You know, we've seen this happen in the UK, we've seen it happen in Australia, you know, so it's not just our, our neighbors to the south that are doing it. There are other systems that are much more like ours that this has been happening. You know, so I didn't want to be just sort of a naysayer throughout this, and I appreciate the uh, commentary that's been going on in the chat as we've been going. Um, I do want to at least provide uh, a little bit of light at the tunnel in the last minute or two that I've got here. Um, if you haven't read this yet, if this hasn't come across your electronic desk, I would highly encourage you take a look at it. It's an article that was published in the Educaz Review. Um, and while it focuses upon higher education, I think the parallels that you have there in the K-12 environment are quite um, good. So one of the things that they have in there, and I'll put up this table that's part of the research that they reviewed, um, and the book that they're referring to there, the one by Barb Means, uh, Mariana Black, uh, Bakai, and uh, Robert Murphy is a very good book, has a lot of K-12 content in it. Um, so it's one of the things that, um, you know, if you're looking for a resource, I would suggest it. And they talk about, you know, how to design online learning and, and the types of things that you want to focus upon in here. And here's some of the categories that they pulled out of um, their uh, book and they use this as part of a poster that they have for actually promoting the book and it's quite useful. One of the other things that uh, Chuck and his colleagues included in the article was this evaluation format and I wanted to include this slide just so it got in the slide deck, not that you need to worry about it, but it looks at this idea of evaluation from four terms and Chuck and his colleagues recommended that we start looking at what we're doing right now and start asking questions around each of these areas. And I, I wanted to, again, make sure that this was in the slide deck so that when you get back to it, you know, these are the things that as folks who are in our bubble, if we can influence the school leaders around us to take an honest look at what's happening right now, as well as an honest look at how we can leverage what's happening right now for the overall improvement of the education system. These are the kinds of questions that I would be asking. Um, you know, obviously you need to change the wording a little bit for K-12 context, but I think these are very good ways to look at, you know, how do we evaluate the current experiment that's, that's going on right now. 
um, because I, I think it can be quite useful. The other area that I believe that we have great potential is in the area of teacher preparation. Obviously, professional development is going to be key over the next 12 months when we look at what's potentially going to happen. But at the same time, um, you know, we do have that curmudgeon down the hall that I keep talking about who's not going to change and, and we're not going to get that perception out of the system until those individuals are out of the system. So the folks that I think that have the greatest potential in all of this are the um, teacher education programs that are out there. Because if we can incorporate this, this kind of teaching, this mode of teaching, the idea of the pedagogies that are useful for when we use these sort of collaborative tools and we can extend our classroom beyond the boundaries of the four walls that it's confined by. Um, and we have a full generation of teachers that are walking in to our schools with this particular mindset. I think that's really when we have the ability to change the system in wholesale kinds of ways. Whereas now, um, you know, as readers of the State of the Nation study will know, we usually have about 5% of the country that has taken an online course, 5% um, of the K-12 population, sorry. It's usually twice that in British Columbia, but that's still only one out of every 10 students. How do we get it so that, you know, all students are doing it? And I think this is really where our long game should look. So I think I've got a couple of minutes there for questions or comments beyond the ones that we had during the session. Um, and I do appreciate the robust chat that's been happening as we've been going on that I've been scanning as we've been talking. So can we field some questions for Michael? Uh, I do want to apologize, Christian. I meant my comment to be private. I'm sorry to put it into the public. I know that the sidebars uh, around that, it, it, it could be a topic of its own, uh, the situations for independent private schools versus public schools. So I wanted to keep the focus so, so we're a team on looking at this issue that we're all facing, which is how people that are doing emergency remote teaching are now calling it online and mistaking in terms of the breadth and depth of uh, those of us that have been involved in this. So questions for Michael on that topic. And I like that notion about the tip of the sword, you know, the single edge and versus the double edge, because I really do think, and if you follow Tony Bates, uh, TonyBates.ca, uh, he says a lot about this in terms of, it's really important that this confusion and, the, the, and it's important. And Karen, I also saw your text going by, really to make this distinction and the more often we can say it again, over and over and over again, that what happens is online learning becomes picked up in the, the social media or in the, the, the formal media. And it's, it's just not the right term. We have to differentiate. Ed jargon aside. Questions, go, folks. Yeah, I have a question, Michael. Um, you said uh, vendors are counting on school leaders to take the easy path. And I'm wondering, what would you suggest that we do about that? Like, do public school teachers have any um, way of pushing back? I would say yes. I mean, one of the things I was in a session earlier, um, actually it was Randy's session earlier, and, and one of the things that I suggested during the session, I had asked if there were any school leaders there, because I'm going to make the assumption that the majority of people in the room are middle school or high school teachers. I'm going to assume we don't have too many elementary teachers there. So the kids that you are teaching right now, in most cases, have three or four or five, depending on how many courses they're taking, other teachers that they will experience throughout the course of a school year. During this emergency remote teaching, most of them have three or four teachers that they have. You wouldn't believe the number of instances where I have come across where you have a single kid who's got four teachers. They're all doing video-based discussion forums because they figure the camera and the face and, you know, makes it more interactive. And you've got one teacher that's using the, um, the video discussion that's built into the LMS, that's built into Canvas or built into Moodle. You've got another that's using Flipgrid. And then you've got a third that's using voice threads. And 
you know, what that requires is while each teacher only has to use one tool, the student and by extension, their parents have to become, uh, you know, have to gain facility in three different tools to accomplish the same purpose. You know, and I'm willing to bet that if you were to pull all of the teachers in your school right now, what tool are you using for X? You know, pick some sort of pedagogical thing. You're going to have multiple tools over each one. There are vendors in education, and there's always going to be vendors in education. You know, 20 years ago, it was textbook publishers. Uh, you know, we've had this whole round of things where Coke and Pepsi would buy us a scoreboard for our football field or our stadium or our gym to become the exclusive vendor um, of soft drinks, you know, in, in, in the, the machines in our school. You know, so there's always going to be vendors there. As teachers, I think right now we've got the unique ability to influence our school leaders on which tools are the appropriate ones for the tasks that we are looking to do. And I, I use the term appropriate uh, very specifically because as opposed to best, because, you know, one of the things that we learned, you know, a couple of Saturdays ago um, when Julia was speaking about, you know, privacy is, you know, there are a lot of good tools out there that don't necessarily on the back end act that good um, or act that appropriately. So, you know, looking at, you know, some of the, all of, you know, all of the aspects of the tool, what are the privacy things around it? What does the tool allow you to do? What are some of the um, challenges or limitations of the tool compared to other tools? You know, as an example, Flipgrid doesn't allow for a threaded kind of discussion the same way the inherent discussion board in the LMS or that voice thread, you know, allows. Does that make it better or worse if we buy, you know, the license copy? I don't know because I've not sat down and looked at the privacy things and all of the other aspects of it. But right now, you guys are the ones that are using these tools. You guys have the ability to, when they sit down and start saying, okay, what tools are going to be our official tools that we're going to use to have a great influence in this? Uh, much more so than you would have over which textbook got picked for your particular course and they bought it for the next five years. Um, you know, how long do we have the license? Do we just go with one year because we're not quite sure about whether or not it's going to do the things that we want? Your school leaders are going to rely upon you guys for that information because they don't know. They're not actually using these tools with the students. trying to scan the chat to see if there's additional yeah. questions. Coming no, I, I didn't actually pick up too much. There's a lot of chatter that uh, about uh, some of the topics and people were talking amongst yeah. themselves. I think they were actually whispering and passing notes, uh, teacher. Sorry, sorry for their behavior. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. So um, I know we're hit the top of the hour in a little bit, so um, I don't want to take up time on the demo slam. And I know most of you are probably here, not for me, but to find out whether or not you won that Chromebook uh, that's being uh, auctioned off. So um, if you do have questions along the way that uh, um, come to you after the fact or that you, uh, we didn't have time for or that you just didn't want to talk about, you can see my contact information there at the bottom. Um, and like all good things, you know, I will turn it back over to Randy now and hopefully I've given you some things to, to think about. And if anything else, I would just say that while the community that we have here, I believe is a great one. Um, it's one that I enjoy interacting with every opportunity Randy gets and allows me to, to have uh, both in person <laughs> and online. Um, but we are a very unique bubble that we have here. And it's important for us to remember that even back when we first started doing this, when we were, you know, young pups and, and, and not very good at this, we were still 10 times better than what most of the folks that have been thrown into this right now are. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. I didn't realize that I had that much control over you. <laughs> 